Welcome to Tape Crusaders. We're here at Meteor in Windsor, Ontario. We're here to review, this is a superhero movie, but it's not based on a comic book, but I call it a superhero movie because it's like a superhero. We're talk here to talk about Robocop. I'm Mike Kell. This is Josh. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. Thanks yeah. for joining uh, us. Thanks for having me again. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, every time. Josh is here every time. And also champion, the owner of Meteor. Thank hello, you. Hello. Hello. That's Thank how you. I wormed my way yeah. into being a regular <laughs> on this podcast is by being like, they can't kick me off now. Otherwise, right. otherwise there's no place else to. Right. That's true. That's true. So as you can see, we have, uh, basically we have, the screen is usually here. This is just the curtains, but mm. RoboCop did just play. Uh, for our live studio audience here, we're here to talk about it. Um, first of all, let me just say, I, I saw this when I was 10 years old. A 10 year old in 2023 would not be permitted to see this film no. because it's so violent. Oh no, no, a 10 year old at the time that you saw it should not have been permitted yeah, that's true, to see that's it. True. Although I, I do recall seeing it at a similar age. Yes, and, uh, yeah, I think so too actually, yeah. So here's the thing, okay, Ian and I are about the same age, but Josh, did you see this when you were a kid? Yeah, I did. Um, okay. I remember seeing bits and parts of it on TV, but I think my earliest memory of watching it in full, I was probably 11, 12, and I watched it with my grandpa. <laughs> and it, he, yeah, we, we would always stay with him uh, and my grandma uh, over the summers for sure. you know a couple of weeks. And uh, yeah, him and I watched this movie. And it's probably been since then that wow. I've seen it. And I thought that I remembered a lot about it and then watching it today it was like it, it was like a whole new experience watching it as an adult well the thing is is it yes it's it's been a long time i've seen it a few times like in recent mm. years but it's been definitely a long time since i've seen it uh ian is this the perfect film it's close to it <laughs> the most perfect film ever made i don't this, know I, i'm gonna say this is about 85 percent towards being the perfect film. And there are a couple of things that sort of stuck out sure. uh, uh, on this viewing that I think they could have done a lot better. Okay. But okay. the things that they did, they did mostly flawlessly. There's just a couple of things they could have added that would have given it just that, sure, that, sure. that little extra, which Chef we can kiss. talk about. <laughs> well, here's the thing is, you know, uh, you know, I've seen it many times. Uh, and there's a couple things I noticed. One is the shooting was actually really good. Um, like the framing, the composition was really good. The editing was really sharp. And the thing I noticed this time around is there was not a second wasted on no. any BS exposition or backstory to the point that there was n almost no backstory. And I, at first I thought it might have been a flaw. Like, for example, uh, we know that Murphy has a wife and a kid but we never meet them in the story. We only see them in the flashback. And I was sitting there thinking, maybe that was a flaw, right? Maybe that was a mistake. But but I actually think it was good. And well, I'll tell you we, why. We can arm wrestle about this in, in a bit. But sure. uh, yeah, tell, tell, I'll tell, tell, tell us why. I'll tell you why I think it's good. Because we only hear Murphy refer to them briefly in the beginning of the movie. Then he sees them in flashback. And the reason I think it works is because we're in Robocop's shoes. Yeah. Robocop. Has a has a hazy memory of his wife and his kid, but it's we we only see what he sees, which is these hazy digital memories, which is mm -hmm. why I think it works. Yeah, if we know his whole backstory, then we know what he's trying to figure out. So right. yeah, not knowing anything about this character helps when he's also discovering rediscovering himself. Right, yeah, it's, right. It's it's a brilliant way to do it. I can see that angle. Mm -hmm. I ha I have a slightly different take. Okay, but um, what's yeah, your take? I, well, my my take. All right. It has to do with uh, the casting of RoboCop, first of okay. all. I think that Peter Weller was the perfect actor to play RoboCop. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think Peter Weller was not the perfect actor to play Officer Murphy. Murphy. Interesting. I think he's a, he's a very wooden actor who doesn't really... Robotic? Eat. Robotic, mm -hmm. in a sense. Uh -huh. And even when he is, um, he's his human self, sure. he's, he's very robotic, he's stilted, he tries to be mm. personable, but he can't really pull it off. And that's fine for the most part, because we don't really see too much of, of Officer Murphy. It's very early in the film that he's shot to bits, and then he becomes <laughs> Robocop. <laughs> to bits. But um, I mean, yeah. But that, that's one of the issues that I have with the film is that we don't we don't learn enough about Murphy to feel mm. a lot of sympathy for him when 
he is getting shot apart in the old mill. And I think uh, uh, maybe 60 seconds of, of a view into his previous life. Of like right? kissing his wife before he goes to work yeah, and playing like, with his kid. Like my, my, my thinking is that we, we meet him at home and he tells his wife, oh, I've just been transferred to uh, Metro South or wherever. And, oh, honey, I'm scared. It's a, night, it's a, it's a jungle out there. And she reassures him, no, you're a good cop. It's going to be fine. He kisses his wife and kids goodbye. Maybe we see that scene that we see later where they're waving sure, goodbye, sure. right? Mm-hmm. Maybe there's another 30 seconds where in the steel mill, Clarence Boddicker's like, instead of where's your partner, where's your partner? How about what's your name, kid? Are you a good cop? Mm. And maybe mm. he reaches, pulls out his wallet, sees a picture of his uh, of his wife and kids, sure. maybe the same picture that he finds later on. And that might give us a little bit more connection with him as a human being. Right. So when he loses his humanity, we get to sort of experience more of that loss ourselves. Uh, I, I, I hmm. do agree. I I think I'm kind of agreeing with you a little bit more with not knowing anything from his personal life. Mm-hmm. But I think what might improve, like talking about what you were talking about, uh, is maybe showing his more of his like personal side with his partner that would have worked right too. yeah because mm-hmm. because you also get to grow to learn her and we already know from what we see in the movie that she's kind of the ticket to him like that first little key of him remembering she's, so she's the ember that- yeah so seeing like their relationship uh i think would definitely help uh especially as the audience to be like okay we know that she's good because mm-hmm. even like throughout they don't fully like we don't know kind of where she stands you know that's actually another flaw in this film i Mm. think is that her character is not developed enough and the relationship's not developed enough and one of the mistakes i think in the writing is we don't know for sure if she knows it's murphy or when she figures out it's murphy like how does she know it's him like oh it's it's the twirl Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But is there a Roma, is there a moment of recognition where she kind of okay? Yeah, okay. When, there when is a, they're in the target okay, room. Sure, sure. Yeah, There's yeah. a little but, musical sting. Okay. And, okay. Mm-hmm. I just wish that there was more. Uh, I I don't know. There was more to that, more development to that, mm-hmm. I guess, or more uh, explored there. Like an Izzy, isn't he? Yeah, exactly. Before, or something. like, because it is pretty quick that right. She it's sees also, the it's also and it's a like, bit oh, morbid. It's... The fact that he is dead, but now he's not dead, right? Like, there's there should be more to it than that. But um, the other thing I want to say about the movie that I was really impressed with this time around was we talked about like how there's no not a second wasted. My favorite type of ending to a film is where the story <laughs> ends on the last frame or the last line. And in this movie, it's it's the um, you know it's the, the the final development of his character. Mm-hmm. What's your name, Murphy? And not only does the movie end, but it just cuts to white Robocop. It's, <laughs> it is, it's so blunt that it's yeah. cheesy, but at the same time, no, that's exactly how it should be. Like yeah. when a movie ends, it should end. We don't need an extra ten minute scene of these characters talking to each other and resolving the story. Thank no. God it's over. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. The cops come and then everyone kisses and makes up and goes. No, just the last the climax of the film. Cut to black, the title of the movie, done. And mm-hmm. I love that. And yeah. it is the peak discovery yes. for, for Robocop. Mm-hmm. He he has fully acknowledged his identity and he makes that assertion. Period. Full yeah. stop. Mm-hmm. We're right. done. So I don't know. I mean, oh, this was a great movie. Okay, we talked about how violent it was. Holy, <laughs> oh my God. Holy. Yeah, it's so this movie, oof. there's the famous scene where okay, what's the other what's the bad cop the robot cl- the, oh, the, uh, the ED-209 ED-209 the when that thing walks droid. in and it shoots the fuck out of that guy <laughs> yeah. it is Kevin. so over <laughs> the top or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. but it's yeah exactly it's like there's not enough <laughs> squibs in the world exactly. yeah. where but did it you find all this fake going, blood it keeps going and you like you're sitting there watching like this is ridiculous no other decade could they have gotten away with this other than the 80s right like this, this level of violence it was l- ridiculous but I loved it but not only is it over the top and ridiculous but it's not like it's not horror violence like there's this there's this undercurrent oh, yeah. of comedy, comedy through the entire right. yeah. and it's a horrible scene to watch and you just feel like my goodness this <laughs> yeah. is this is horrifying but also the fact that this is so over the top it's it's kind of funny oh, of course we're it's all laughing funny. yeah we're all right yeah I don't know about you. yeah it 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 feels like 
it's it feels like what every shitty like cheesy 80s movie wants to be you know what i mean yeah. like every like you know see like crummy cop movie or like weird 80s action film it wants to be this like this is it perfect well this is uh, this is also quintessential 80s like if you were yeah. to name the most important movies of the 80s i'd probably name like top gun mm-hmm. batman mm-hmm. and probably this maybe top five i don't know i mean this is up there as far as the defining film of the 80s mm. okay fine dirty dancing but um <laughs> the thing is though is um there's other scenes too like when he gets his hand shut off and then his entire oh. arm that is disgusting it's 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 actually frightening like that scene because the, uh, the guy who plays the the bad guy what's his name he's the Red father foreman <laughs> yeah he is okay, uh, which uh, he's the, he's the dad from that 70 show yeah kurtwood Kurt Kurt smith yes Kurt okay smith. okay first of all the glasses were intentional mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. he was based on a real life person i can't remember who it was i think he was a mm. nazi he was ba- it was purposely like oh I don't know who it was, but if you if you do research and you're out there, look them up. You'll know who I'm talking about. But they purposely want him to have glasses because it gives huh. him that extra like intellectual look, right? Yeah. Such a good actor when he strolls into the room and he's got the Every silencer. Every single scene that Kurtwood Smith is in is brilliant. Yes. Perfection. He is the ultimate villain. Yeah. And yet this part again, this is also, it, it goes with the over the top violence that you can't help but kind of like him of course you mm-hmm. can't he's help, always in control like there's, yeah. there, there's just something cool. about him it's like man this guy is just a little bit too badass yeah i can't root against him mm-hmm. right i agree all good I, sorry what were you gonna say uh, he does such a great job of also like i'm gonna bring up the cast oh yeah um like what you were saying with him always being in control there was also never a moment where he's like, uh, it's RoboCop. Like he's never scared of him. For, except for that, like a, except for that one moment at the very, very end. Right. When, uh, when Leon drops all the metal yeah. on him, then he's kind of like, Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're not a cop anymore. You're actually going to shoot me. Yeah. Well, let's talk about this. Yeah. Yeah. And, just for, and just that goes for, back to what one moment which is there. Fine right. though, which is that, fine for that one moment. And, and that also goes back to what Mike was saying though, with him being the intellectual bad guy, he realizes, cause he knows the whole time that there's programming set where he won't just kill somebody. Mm-hmm. He's, he's gotta be a good cop. He's gotta follow the law. Yeah. And the fact that he realizes at that moment that that directive is gone. Right. That's when he's finally scared. Like yes. he doesn't have the upper hand yes. through, with good his point. smarts. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. He's smart. He's, yeah. he's a smart guy. Yeah. Um, let's also talk about the, um, who's the, the, the head of the, uh, is it Ronnie Cox? Ronnie Cox. Mm. Who plays well, he's, Dick he's play- Jones. Yeah. The number two of <laughs> OCP. He, he's another good actor. Like, yeah. you know, again, and another, another seminal eighties villain actor yes. too. Yeah. And he, totally hamming it up too. Like, like, Right. The, the perfect amount, I think, sure. for this film. Yeah. And I think, like, again, when I say this is a quintessential 80s film, watching this as a kid, I think these actors, those two, as well as, oh, who's the guy that played the guy? Um, M- M- how do you pronounce his name? McGill? McGill Ferrer, who's from Twin Peaks as well. Mm-hmm. Um, those guys defined that, even though they're not Wall Streeters, that, that kind of Wall Street 80s coke sniffing pieces of shit that I hated (laughs) because these guys defined it for me. Right. And that Mm -hmm. scene where he's, you know, with those hookers or I don't know if they're hookers, maybe they're not hookers, but Uh, they're, they're they're models. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. Okay. Okay. But I love that scene. I mean, he's just that guy again. He's a great actor and what a, what what a, a fantastic role. scene too oh, amazing like, yeah 100 percent. It, it just goes to show how brutal the film is too yes. and how brutal the these the our main villains are because i i was not expecting that to happen so soon is death like it <laughs> right they they, right. they don't hold back like nothing is off the table it, it was almost like moving so quickly that i thought I thought that was going to be the climax. Like the right. first time RoboCop goes into the bad guy's office, I'm mm. like, oh, is the movie over? Because, <laughs> because again, they don't waste any time. Yeah. There's no speeches. There's no flashbacks. There's no backstory. Mm. They just keep it moving. But it's good though, because then once you get past that, now you're like, you're in uncharted territory. Where's the movie going to go now? I have mm-hmm. no idea where it's going to mm. go, which is very cool. Because then when he comes down the stairs and the cops have all turned on him, right? Now... Oh, what's going to happen? Oh, Nancy Allen's going to help him. And, you know, it's just, it's just very cool. And then he goes back again, 
coming back to the symmetry of the movie, he goes back to the um, abandoned factory yeah, place right. the, from the, the beginning. The mill where he, be, yeah. where he basically he became, died. Right. Mm. right well, yeah, his origin, basically. That mm-hmm. was so good. Mm. Um, there's another bad guy I want to talk about. He kind of reminds me of Flea from um, Red Hot Chili Peppers. Oh, the guy that plays uh, Emil? Yeah, yeah. What's his name here? Uh, I got the list here. Uh, boy, I should have this ready. Well, but we, we refuse to do research on the show. Sorry, guys. <laughs> anyway, I can't find his name here. I, I can't pick his name out in a lineup here. But anyway, the guy that gets dumped with uh, toxic waste. Uh, yeah. That's this guy, oh, right this guy here, here. Paul McCrane. Pa- Paul McCrane. Yeah. Another great actor. He's actually perfect for that role. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And his demise, again, th- this, this movie's saying a lot of things. It's set in the future there's crime there's corruption but there's also toxic waste uh, <laughs> right uh, you know everywhere yeah. not that, everywhere but that particular scene since i also saw the movie as a young kid yes haunted that, you that it, it did mm-hmm. haunt me i had this un, this irrational fear you know like when you're a kid you have this fear of, of quicksand the, of the quicksand yes. and the bermuda triangle <laughs> yes. and like these things that are never uh, going to really impact your life yeah toxic waste is another one of yes, them it's like 100 toxic waste I had this this fear of for the the rest of my adolescence mm. because watching Emil just oh, I know oh, and the makeup is me. so good oh my goodness his ha- face hanging oh. off and his, his fingers arms are dripping oh, and he's just yep yeah and and then so to grotesque. then to see him <laughs> run down by the 6000 SUX it's driven by Bodica and he liquefies yeah. mm. unbelievable horrifying so good. horrifying there's a lot, and that's the thing. There's there's a lot of things about this movie. There's comedy. There's body horror, mm-hmm. right? There's social commentary. There's politics. Um, Even in those slow moments when he takes off his helmet, mm-hmm. it it's so fascinating, but also like again, kind of like grotesque and sure, weird. Right. Like seeing that the his like skin almost like folds yes. behind like the metal casing yes. of his new head, and and he mm-hmm. says, "You might not like what you're gonna see." Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I love. Okay, a, as far as the directing, we have to talk about this. What's his name? Murphy. Alex Murphy. Alex Murphy. He dies and then the screen goes black and then the screen digitizes and shows, oh, POV, what's happening? Mm-hmm. And we see that, you know, he's getting an operation, then he's getting upgraded, then then there's a New Year's party and blah, blah, blah. Such a brilliant sequence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then when he wakens as Robocop, he's walking POV and then we see a TV screen mm-hmm. showing what he actually looks like. But, but just a glimpse. Just yeah. a glimpse. Just a then glimpse. Then we have to wait. We have to wait for all the cops. But they're in, in between that, like bring him in the side door. And then yes. we see him walking past this right. frosted glass. Yeah. So we, we get a bit more of a glimpse, yes. but we still mm-hmm. don't know. He turns, we see him off to the side from behind. And then the next few shots are from inside this cage, yeah. giving us this sort of separation between like, this is us. This yes. is the real world. In this cage is this whatever this right. is we don't Good even point. know yet Good point. and it's so intentional to yep. the fact that they introduce him in that doorway with the doors opening because it's like you were saying with like everything having a mirror sure every time that, yes, yes yeah yeah you said it, it like reflected <laughs> did i say that yeah yeah because you were Today? talking about the mill yeah you're talking about how oh yes yeah oh his oh, origin is the mill yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's yeah, symmetrical yeah, okay. yeah. Mm. uh <laughs> but uh the mirror yeah i got you yeah. uh uh, uh it's like poetry. It rhymes. Yeah, it rhymes. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, uh, what was I even saying now? Oh, the, the I doors. Threw you off. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, the, the, doors. the the ED zero zero one is always introduced by like the two doors swinging open. Oh, look at that! And then like walking, and then uh, when he's first introduced, it's in the precinct, and the doors are opening. Sure. So it's almost like this like corporation versus police, and that's, oh, that is a, that yeah. is a theme throughout. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then mm-hmm. when he's finally uh, reintroduced at the end. It is that same thing. It's the two double doors opening uh, in that office, yes. and uh, but it's like their demise now. Good like point. It's, it's like come back to to haunt sure. them. Sure. It's there's a and, lot of oh, there, stuff there is like that so much movie. little symmetry like that. Yeah. And that particular scene at the end there, you see when uh, Dick Jones, he um, I don't know if we ever learn his name. The old man who is the number one at the company. Oh uh, yeah. But uh, when he's taking him prisoner, he's using the same gun that Kevin was, was yeah, using yeah, yeah, yeah. when he was shot up at the very beginning mm-hmm. of the film. Yeah. So instead of ED209 shooting up this innocent kid mm-hmm. who's holding this gun, now we have RoboCop shooting up this villain who's mm-hmm. holding this gun. Right. 
So Paul Verhoeven is what we call an auteur. Because even though it's a pop film and it's violent and it's whatever, it, he's still planning everything meticulously. Yeah. I mean, maybe it was the screenwriters as well. But um, the fact that this film is so perfect, it's possible to have it popular entertainment, entertainment, but also have it be meticulously planned. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that's what happened yeah, of here, course. right? Mm -hmm. This is a great movie. Um, again, this is not based on a comic book, but he is like a superhero. There's just parallels with Deathlock and other characters mm -hmm. like that. But just the fact that we well, have- Judge Dredd too. Judge Dredd, yes, yeah, yeah. 100%. Is, is he, I, th I thought he was based off of Judge Dredd. Well, I mean, maybe there's, I'm not sure. I, oh, okay. I don't know if it, maybe oh. he was, but there's, there's some similarities. Mm. But the fact that he has an origin story where he has to get revenge against the people that kind of made him what he is, right? And then we have, we even have a little scene, which even Superman did and Spider-Man did, where he gets his powers, then he goes off on his little adventure and he arrests this guy, he arrests that guy, he arrests that guy. Mm -hmm. And I love how it's, again, like a superhero movie where you go, oh, look, it's a it's a typical situation, but how would Robocop handle this? Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to think, I think there was three things. There was um, a, a hold up at a, at a corner store. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that scene too. Yes. Because mm -hmm. uh, the bad guy, he knows how fucked he is yeah. and he's just shooting him screaming fuck me fuck yeah, me yeah, fuck yeah, me yeah, yeah. he it's, knows he's toast it's also so funny too because it, he hasn't even seen Robocop but he knows like that's the first <laughs> yes. time Robocop Good has point. ever been Good out point. in the world Good there's point. no announcement or anything on the news it was just all of a sudden He's like, oh, I'm fucked. There's yeah, this giant robot point. here right. to, you know, I, to kill I love me. it. And, 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 you know, then, then, there's, um, then there's the hostage situation. Is there one in between? There's the, the, the sexual assault. Yes, yes that's which right. Which yeah, yeah. has one of the best moments in cinema. Oh, yes. When it's Robocop. It's actually frightening how close it happens. But the close call, he uses his laser focused <laughs> vision. Describe it. What happens? Uh, well, he, he, shoots, uh, he shoots one of these criminals right in the dick yeah, yeah. right but in he the shoots dick. through the girl's dress mm -hmm. so closely that i you you actually think he's gonna shoot her and mm -hmm. her yeah mm -hmm. yes yeah but no no but he doesn't but he doesn't because he has such perfect uh and i think as he's aiming you see like the the computer uh, yeah, overlay yeah. and it's like directive to protect the innocent right and he's still yeah it's yeah. great it's great so, uh, yeah, I mean, again, perfect film, symmetrical. What else can you say about it? Oh, let's talk. We haven't talked about Nancy Allen, okay? Mm. Oh, so yeah. we have a politically incorrect crew, pe crew person here who made the comment that she would look prettier if she had long hair. Oh, no. <laughs> We don't talk that way in North America, but um, she's a great actress. She be she came to fame in the 70s through okay. Brian De Palma's thrillers like Carrie, mm -hmm. oh. Blowout. Hmm. Um, as well as I think she was in Obsession, but I could be wrong about that. Actually, a great actress. Unfortunately, I don't think she did much after RoboCop, as far as I know. I know I, very I, little. I'm not too like, familiar yeah, with, but she's actually done actress. a ton of like. If you watch Blowout, Blowout's an excellent film hmm. with John Travolta. Mm -hmm. Actually, oh. in 1983, hmm. it's a great movie. But Nancy Allen, yeah. And then, do you remember you guys have seen Carrie, right? Yeah, long time yeah. ago. Long she time was ago. the the I think the main girl that was bullying Carrie. Oh, and I think she was, really? She was with she was John Travolta's girlfriend, and one of the main people that was bullying Carrie in that film. Yeah, that's Nancy mm. Allen. She had long hair back then. Okay. Yep. So anyway, great actress. Uh, again, could have been more developed in this movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, but, but she was likable. Yeah. Oh, yeah. she was great. Yeah. Yeah. She yeah. Great. Like she was. No, we 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 get very little of her in this movie. I feel like, but we still right. know her character sure. pretty well. Yeah. Um. And. Yeah, the way that they set up the movie too, I was, I couldn't remember if she lived or died at the end of the movie. So yes, I was good like, point. I, I, I was worried that she was going to die the entire time watching it this time. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know what? One thing I got to give this movie credit for, there was a, it's an 80s movie and it's a big action movie, but they never, like there are catchphrases like, what what's, what is it that Murphy says? Um, Dead, Dead or alive, alive, you're, you're, coming, you're with coming with me. With me. Yeah. Now that's a great line. But even a classic movie like Terminator or Aliens, which are both directed by Jim Cameron and written by Jim Cameron, he gives them those one-liners like, uh, you know, 
get away from her, you bitch, or whatever. Just just right. those kind of Hollywood uh, tropes. And in this movie, they didn't stoop to that. They had a few a of bit. those. Your they had a few of those. Creep. Your move creep was a, was a good one. And uh, uh, Clarence Bodiger with uh, Bitches Leave. When, uh, okay, but yeah, no, but that's different. That, that's a good line, though. That's different than that's different than Hasta la Vista, baby. Right? That's right. Different. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. you know what, though, I I think uh, it kind of lends to his humanity coming through, especially with uh, a lot of his personality as this robot being his son's favorite TV show. Like, sure. It's like a yes. cartoon. It is like one of those things. So the catchphrases, the twirling of the gun, and yeah. putting it back. It kind of fits for me like you know th those one-liners didn't stand out as something that was weird and you know what's funny is that's actually a subplot that's very under like developed in the movie but it's only in flashbacks and in his memories mm -hmm. so it's an interesting little tiny subplot that it's almost like you could if you, you blink you'll miss it right but right. yeah remembering his like he, he mentions it at the beginning then he has the flashback and then he does it at the end i think that's the mm -hmm. only time you really see it mm -hmm. but um is there anything else we just say about this movie I mean, we all love this movie, right? Um, yeah, it's... it's Champ Ian? I mean, we Fantastic. could... Fantastic. <laughs> oh, someone out there has something to say? What do you think? It was a fantastic 80s movie. I loved it. it was fun. Like, for 80s movies, fantastic. Wait, what do you mean for 80s movies? Do you think 80s movies aren't as good? No, I, I didn't mean to say like that because I do love... <laughs> like, like, I, like, some 80s movies are some of my favorite movies. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like... As far as filmmaking goes. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. we gotcha. I there think was the one part where, like, it shows the dude shoot the windshield, and then the next shot, the windshield's fucking clean. I didn't notice that. Oh, yeah, I, I didn't, didn't notice, notice that. that. Now, but I, I do know what you're saying, though. Like, like, you, like I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to take anything away from this. Yeah. I loved it. I thought it was, I had never seen it before. I enjoyed it very much. We, also, I, I, we have to say, if the movie's set in Detroit, but it was not filmed in Detroit. I no, think it was it's filmed, filmed in, in Los Angeles Dallas or, or somewhere, Dallas, yeah. Calgary. Yeah. There was a couple of establishing shots of Detroit, but I, I got to give credit. Be beyond like the obvious filmmaking with the special effects, the shot near the end of the movie where he pulls up to that headquarters mm -hmm. building, mm -hmm. uh, the bottom is real, the rest is a painting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. I love stuff, yeah, yeah, I love stuff like that. And in terms of, I, I've given this a bit of thought too, you don't necessarily want this movie shot on location in Detroit because it might be a little distracting, right? Hmm. Like for the residents or for the well, movie? <laughs> for just, just in general to see like, oh, it's there, that's this building and that's this building. Maybe only because we live I think it's here. fine. You know I, I mean, maybe, I, like, maybe. Like a movie, a movie set in New York, it's not distracting when you see... The Statue of Liberty or the yeah. Twin Towers, yeah. I, I, I think the anonymity, though, mm. of of the locations, right, just didn't like it didn't do anything to detract, sure, from anything. So okay. I, I actually think, like Alfred Hitchcock thinks, if you shoot a movie that's set in the Netherlands, you should exploit the Netherlands. And I, I tend to agree with him. Like, if it's going to be in Detroit, you might as well show the Renaissance Center. You might as well show what is it called? Train the, station. Yeah, yeah, yeah whatever all, the Penobscot yeah. building. And mm -hmm. they mentioned the tigers in this film, like make it set in Detroit because they see Detroit a lot, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And and also when the movie was filmed, Detroit was much more crime ridden than it is now. Maybe it was too dangerous to shoot it. In oh, Detroit. That, I wouldn't be surprised. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. yeah. People don't believe me when I tell them that um, if they're not around from around here, but it was true. Yeah. It was, it was a bad scene in the eighties. Right. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so here we go. We have a classic, not, superhero film but superhero adjacent film not, again not based on a comic book it's an original property there were two sequels one of them i think both of them written by frank miller if you can believe it really Dark Knight fame yes he at least wrote the hmm. second one yeah there was a tv show there was a cartoon for kids are you kidding me no <laughs> cocaine no hookers in that could he, could, plenty could, of he violence. could he fly in the in the cartoon I don't know if he, he could, could fly because he could fly in the in the third. Uh, Are you serious? Oh, I don't think I ever film. saw that. Yeah. You know, it's also funny. There's a remake that no one gives a shit about. Yeah, I was going to say. Has anyone ever talked about or seen the remake? Only when talking about the original. Exactly. No <laughs> one know. cares about the remake. Don't no. remake yeah. films, no. right? Yeah. No. There's plenty of ideas out there. You don't need to re-explore. Mm -hmm. Right. They are also. I think they're always talking about doing another one, but there there's talks about doing RoboCop four instead of. Okay. So, so I don't know if they'll call it four yeah, or see, what, but it's 
supposed the, to be the set. The naming like, conventions, and you know what they'll probably do? They'll probably do RoboCop 4, but they'll still acknowledge RoboCop remake somehow. Uh, right, maybe, The same yeah. way Halloween, they have sequels that acknowledge other sequels, but not others. And then they have others that reboot everything. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Okay, so here we go. RoboCop is awesome. Check it out. If you haven't seen it, it's a great mm-hmm. movie, even for the 80s, right? Um, <laughs> and then, uh, okay, so on the next episode of Tape Crusaders, we're going to be talking about what is it again? The spirit. The spirit. The spirit. The spirit. <laughs> Not the Frank Miller spirit, the 1987 TV movie, The Spirit. Can't wait to see that yeah, one, guys. It's going to yes. be rough. If, and then the episode after that, it's going to be uh, the Superboy pilot. Ew. It's going to be bad. If we you have some stick rough with ones it, we got out. some rough ones. But that's okay because. <laughs> Some, sometimes the rough ones are even more fun yes, to talk they about. Are, yes, they're they're more I mean, fun we to can. rip on. And we, there, yeah, there yeah. might even be an impromptu podcast created tonight. Uh, I don't know if we should talk about it because we haven't finalized it yet, <laughs> but we might have created a podcast. Really? Yeah, 30 minutes ago. Yeah. It's called Media Uniplex, uh, hosted by <laughs> Ian. What? And we're reviewing all the other movies that are not part of Tape Crusaders. Oh, my like, goodness. T- starting with... Uh, spirited I, away. So I, see you then. I, 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 lo- I love. I love how I was not in any way a part of this yeah. conversation, and somehow I'm the host. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. hosting a. Who a knows? Show. Maybe if it doesn't exist, we'll just cut this part out. But if it does exist, keep it in. <laughs> or okay. keep it in. Yeah, keep or it keep in. Or keep it in. Historical no curiosity. You let us know. Do you want us to see us review other movies besides superhero movies? Let us know. Write us in the comments. Uh, mm. We want to thank you for watching this episode and every episode. Also, be sure to check out Slam, where we talk about DC superheroes. Comic Book Syndicate, where we talk about new superhero movies. As well as, what else do we do? Is that it? We do comics. We, we do, do comics. Yeah. We do everything. Yeah. So yeah. Be, I want to thank you guys for joining us again. Thank well, Ian for showing the film. Yeah. Well, thank thanks so for much. coming to watch the 5. film. 5.1 Surround. We want to thank our studio audience over there. Thank, thank you. you so much for coming out. Thank you. Thank Angela. Thank you, Angela. Thank you so thank much, you. as always. Yes, and we'll see you next time.